Welcome back to the Keller and Kess show. I hope you all enjoyed our, our first teaser episode. promise it will get better from there, but thanks for everybody that listened in. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you're listening at. This week we got a, a really cool guest coming on for our first actual episode with a guest. Meg, do you want to give a little intro? Sure. Casey Bellamy, obviously a three-time Olympian, veteran of the USA Hockey Blue Line for a while, and she's got some great stories. She's one of the most hilarious teammates that I've ever met, so some funny ones in there as well. And yeah, it was a fun interview to be a part of, so hopefully everybody will tune in for this one. Yeah, somebody that I think arguably, like, according to us, retired too early. We could have used her used her on our team, but for her own life, uh, and she'll talk about that, she was ready to move on and, and get going with some other things. We could definitely still use her. Like, I don't think I've met another athlete that can just jump in to a workout and hit a 30-inch vert jump first no. week back in the gym. No. Unbelievable. Yeah. I was not gifted with those jeans. <laughs> You're pretty close. I don't know. It's an You're illusion. I'm just tall. But, yeah. <laughs> so it was just New Year's. Kess and I got to spend the New Year's weekend together out going to the winter classic and I always laugh about this story because last New Year's or two ago we were together in Florida and Kess was talking about New Year's resolutions and how she didn't have any of hers yet and it was like January 14th so I'm hoping now that you may have one in your back pocket are you ready unfortunately still no New Year's resolution it's January 5th I'll, I'll hopefully have it before the 14th I was kind of thinking about a dry January, but one <laughs> after after the yeah, New like, Year's weekend. Yep, January third, dry January. But I don't know. We'll think I think we that. talked her off the ledge on that one. We'll just rein it in a little bit. Yeah, rein it in. Only a few, maybe one a week. Although your different. your Winter Classic was a little bit different than than my experience this go around. I think you were working. Although I was not seeing that on social media. You were playing wiffle ball, hitting bombs at Fenway. Yeah, that was pretty fun. The guys, uh, part of my job was to bring them over to play some wiffle ball. And after they left, I wanted to try it. I didn't want anybody to see me. So I was like, hey, could I get up there and try this? And the guys were whiffing a few times there. So I was like, oh, I'm going to just whiff and strike out here. And first three up, just cranked them. I don't know if the pitcher was going <laughs> Easy that on me. Yep. Yeah. Wait, was that pitcher like professional wiffle ball pitcher? He yep. was like throwing some crazy unbelievable balls. Like stuff would like be four feet wide and just like crank back into the middle. He oh was my God. unreal, which I don't think he threw that against me, but yeah, he was being nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We used to like tape the wiffle balls. Did you ever play growing up? Yeah. We used to like tape them. And so they would spin a lot faster and like curve harder. But now you see like all these videos of professional wiffle ball pitchers and they throw insane pitches. Yeah. So I was surprised when I saw you going yard. Yeah. I didn't expect that from you. I was surprised too. But <laughs> yeah, it was fun though. I got to work that, um, watch the game from the dugout, which is pretty cool. Mostly watching it on the screen and then I got uh, to go rinkside for some of it. So caught the end of it. Disappointing, disappointing loss for us, but. Overall, great experience. Yeah, disappointing loss for the Pens, but it was a fun time for the, the Boston, the city of Boston and the Bruins. I also started in the dugout, and you couldn't see anything, like you said, so we made our way up to Sam's deck, and the ushers are like, you guys have tickets for up here? You have tickets? And we're like, yeah, yeah, like, all access. And then we're like, yeah, Amanda Kessel let us up here. <laughs> you just snuck your way up there. Yeah, That's yeah awesome. act like you know what you're doing. That's and then awesome. just find a seat. But, yeah, it was a cool game and definitely a different experience. We were talking about them the last one we went to in Minnesota. Our 2022 Olympic team was announced there. And it was the coldest one in history, right? Like negative 10. Yeah, negative 10. I think it felt like negative 20-something with the wind chill. I don't Crazy. know how the guys were playing. but Everything was freezing. Like drinks were freezing. Your nostrils were freezing. We had to stand outside for maybe 20 minutes to get announced. And it, that may have been the coldest I've ever yeah. been. So yeah. I, I don't know how they played. 
or even blocked any shots. No. Nope. Yeah, I, I would like to see shot blocks block. from that game. Yeah, I would None. have been moving out of the way if I was yep. them. No chance. On and off. I think they have heaters on the bench, but still, it, it was borderline illegal to be playing in that outdoor game. Yeah, have you played in any outdoor games? I haven't, no. I stay away. Is it on the list? Would you want to play in one? If it was like the temp of the Boston game, like 30s, 40s, I'd be <laughs> down. on the weather. Anything colder, I think I'm, I'm sitting out healthy scratch that game. <laughs> taking yourself off the power play yeah i played at fenway in 2017 and it was pouring rain no way i had a bubble like you could not (laughs) see a dang thing and i fell like you get up soaking wet and it was it was not like a good hockey game at all did you win we ended up winning wow yep we ended up winning one of my teammates from south boston grew up there like she's the biggest Boston accent is another hilarious teammate. She ended up having two or three goals, and we were calling her like Miss Boston. Yeah, that is unbelievable. It was great. Yeah, it'd be pretty cool if we could get like a U.S. Canada game at an outdoor outdoor. That's what I'm sometime. saying. Maybe maybe next year the Seattle uh, Vegas one. We'll hop on board with that. Yeah, just ta- tackle on to that one. Yeah. Although I'd love to play at Fenway again. I know. Like that was unbelievable. Let's put it put so it in cool. someone's ear. Yeah. Put it out there. Put it in the universe. <laughs> yeah, maybe it'll come true. Yep. So speaking of US Canada, did you watch the World Junior semifinal game last night? I did, I did. That I know we were just fun. talking about the controversial goalie interference calls. And we may have differing views on this. I think so. I mean I think both of them were ridiculous. I, I still can't get over it. Like swearing maybe at my maybe a little home cooking. Yeah, home cooking for sure. Like we're definitely a little biased, but I think that first one was awful. I thought it was like a weak call, pretty ridiculous. I didn't think he interfered with him really that much. Puck was in the crease. He went in. He was minding his own business, and I didn't think the goalie was gonna get over to save that at the end. And almost looked like Canada's D didn't really allow his pad to get over. Mm-hmm. It was their own players. Everybody was in there. It's unbelievable. And that second changes the course of a game. Yeah. I mean, they were kind of done after that one, but then you add in the second one there. Like, give them a little life and terrible, terrible, terrible call. I know. The second one I actually agreed with a little bit more. I thought the refs yeah. just had a late whistle. They had no... They had no idea where know. the puck was. It was under under the goalie's skate. I think they could have blown it dead, but they didn't. And then they ended up pushing it in. It was like half a second. Think about how many goals. Like, I was thinking, like, we've had games where, like, they whack the goalie's pad, like, four times, push them into the net, and they still call it a goal. But somehow in the semifinal, you know, we had, I don't know, p- other people that wanted to be the stars of the show. Yeah, I mean, we've we've had some goalie interference calls go our way we we have that's definitely for back sure. in the so, day so i can't yeah <laughs> it's hard to judge from the sidelines at the end of the day i think both of us just wanted the u.s to win obviously yeah that's who we're cheering for but they brought home the bronze medal and that was also another crazy game eight seven just wild like never seen a game with that many goals in my life let alone a bronze medal game at a world juniors just uh this Young kids and all the skill that they have now. There's a lot, a lot of offense. And yeah, there's literally nine goals scored in the second period. Yep, I was looking. I missed like the last like couple of minutes. I think of the period, and all of a sudden I come back for the third, and it was five five. It's like, Were you I just no like, clue. what what is happening? Yeah, I thought I like had I don't know I don't know what happened. I thought I missed like the third period and something was going on, but came back five five, and then I thought when they scored to make it seven six, then the third that. That was that it. That would be it. 20 seconds in. 20 seconds left. Nope. Sweden ties it up. But that's hockey. Yeah, hockey. And I feel like for some reason, World Juniors is just like one of those games where like the amount of insane comebacks. Like I remember one time, I think it was Russia on Canada. Like years ago, there's always seems to be games that are just crazy comebacks. Yeah. World Juniors magic. Yep. All, all the that stuff seems to happen, I feel like, in in the big games. 
Yeah. You yeah. can never count anybody out. No. Nope. That's but maybe sure. maybe we'll see some magic happen in the U18 Women's Worlds yep. that are, are going on. I hope to see the U.S. go far and hopefully bring home a gold medal for us. But will you be watching that? Yeah, definitely. I'll be tuning in. It's starting here soon. Uh, I think on the 8th, the tournament opens up. So a lot of those games will be on NHL Network, a great opportunity for people to to be exposed to the women's game. I have a little bit of a a tear for this uh, tournament. I mean, obviously, I, I want USA to win, and you know, I'm diehard USA, but my sister-in-law is coaching Team Canada, head coach of the U18 Women's World Championship. So, so you're I gotta, torn? I'm not torn. Like, I'm 100% USA, but I have to give her a little shout-out and All right. like, hope that they can do the, the best <laughs> they can without beating the U.S. Yeah, so we're hoping for good coaching decisions, but we want the U.S. to bring home gold. Yep. Down for that. All right. Well, I'll definitely be tuning in and cheering <laughs> for Coach Coach Kessel. Coach Kessel, yep. She's a Kessel, so they got a Kessel behind the Canadian bench. Kind of funny to think about. You've infiltrated. I have. The but Kessel she family is in- infiltrated. You know, she doesn't tell me anything. I don't tell her no anything. No secrets? No, we keep it separate. Separate no, you're not trying rivalry. to ruin any family gatherings? No, we can't. Keep we can't get into that. Yeah. Fair enough. Well, do you have anything else? I don't think so. I'm just excited for, for people to kind of learn more about us, learn more about our guests, and you know, people can hopefully let us know who else they want to hear from, what they want to hear about, give us any input. We're just getting this thing started, but really excited for it. Just getting started in 2023, kicking it off with Casey Bellamy, one of the best to ever play for the USA. And yeah, like Kess said, hopefully uh, we just continue to take off and hear from you guys who you want to hear from and get some special guests in the future. Let's welcome in our guest, Casey Bellamy. What's up, everyone? Uh, We have a pretty unreal guest today. Um, We're going to start off by listing some of her career stats she's got quite the list here um team usa's blue line for over 10 years she's a seven-time world champion three-time olympian helped bring home gold for the first time in 20 years kess and i were lucky enough to be a part of that team led by her and she also led every camp in penalty minutes and scrums in front of the net (laughs) most fights against her own teammates (laughs) absolutely (laughs) Maybe as the highest vert jump on the team that we've ever seen. Um, Casey Bellamy, everyone. Welcome, Case. Woo! Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thanks for having me. This is awesome. You guys are going to crush it. Thanks for joining our podcast. Yep. Our first guest. Um, you know, we're just trying to tell everybody stories. You obviously had a very long and successful career, but how did you get there? You know, so we just want to start with, like, how did you get into hockey? What was your family like growing up? Where did your passion come yeah, from? Yeah, we heard some uh, funny stories right before we started that you and Rob were sharing about uh, your mom and dad yelling, skate, oh, yeah, in, the, they're in the stand. So just tell us a little bit about what that was like. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I basically got into hockey because of my brother, Rob. Uh, I was a ballerina at the time in dance. My mom <laughs> saw it. That's a female. That. And she should go into dance because that's how all the females you know, are brought up. But... I wasn't into it, um, and one day I was uh, just around the house, went down to his, d- went down to the basement, and my brother's equipment was airing out at the time, and I just tossed it all on, <laughs> just to see, I, I guess how it would be, and I walked upstairs and told my parents I wanted to play. That had to smell awful. Uh, I didn't even remember it, but I thought it was it. disgusting. Probably, probably didn't work as hard yet. Um, <laughs> but my mom said yes. My dad said no right away. My dad didn't want me to play. I think. At that time, girls just didn't play hockey and uh, didn't think anything of it. Um, but, you know, I think my dad came around a little bit and I just did, went out to a free skate and just loved it so much, felt so free. The only thing I remember from it was I had a mouth guard and I hated having a mouth guard in. It was the weirdest thing ever. Um, but, yeah, ever since then, I, I continued to play hockey and I've loved it. I loved it ever since I retired. I did not know that you were... Twinkle a ballerina. Toes? Yeah. We yeah. did not know. You haven't seen my dance moves? Um, no. I've seen your moves. Not at but towel. <laughs> no, not at towel. We'll, save, are... that. we'll save that for later <laughs> in this episode. Biggest talk regret. about towel. <laughs> so what age was that that you got on ice? Probably five years old, okay. I want to say around that time. Yeah, we were uh, living in 
Rhode Island, and then my dad got this unbelievable opportunity to move to Western Mass. And I wasn't playing hockey yet, but I think around that five-year-old mark, I started playing. And then you obviously played other sports too. So what were those other sports? Yeah, um, growing up, it was mostly hockey and a little bit of baseball. So those were my two sports growing up. You know, when I wasn't playing hockey, I was playing either baseball or softball. And then when I got to Berkshire, I played field hockey as well, which I never played in my whole entire life, but I thought it would prepare me well for ice hockey, conditioning-wise. And I ended up loving it, you know, by the end. <laughs> conditioning-wise, we, we have that on here. We're I hate get conditioning. To that. <laughs> Every day is leg day. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Um, so you talked about a little bit um, how girls didn't really play hockey when you were growing up, and it was kind of a battle to allow your yourself to play hockey with your mom and whatnot. When did you realize girls hockey was an option and there was college hockey and there was the Olympics and the pinnacle of our sport? Yeah, I would say around, I played boys hockey all growing up um, until I was in eighth grade and I loved it. There was some adversity to be faced there. Um, guys, you know, didn't really want a girl on the team, same with the opposing team, but over time, I realized this is a sport I loved, and I wanted to continue to pursue it. Um, girls hockey, not an option around the Western Massachusetts at that time. It was either playing for the Connecticut Polar Bears or Assabet Valley, which was like two and a half hours away. With three other kids that were in sports, it was so challenging for my parents, and I understood that. Um, so I started getting involved in girls hockey, just doing summer tournaments here and there. And it was different because I was playing checking with the boys and I was you know pretty physical so my first time with girls hockey I you're right so three penalties <laughs> racked up the penalty mats yeah. and nothing changed it was like welcome to women's <laughs> hockey but um it was an adjustment in that aspect but I enjoyed the locker room and the camaraderie it was like feeling more part of a team than with the boys so that was the most exciting part of it all and I think honestly the physical part of your game like that's what made you such a elite and great defender like being able to separate the players from the puck and just bring like a grittiness to our team. Yeah. Like we definitely miss that at some points and it just fuels the rivalry. So would you say that's like a huge part of your your game that you carried out with you? Yeah, I would definitely say I tried to level it out by the end of my career, <laughs> but and it was probably the most fun part of me as a player I loved it like just that grittiness never tr backing down um understanding when to be more physical when to set the tone and not I think as I grew and the experiences that I had um you know that kind of shaped me as yeah the player that I was but I always wanted to bring more of an offensive you know presence to the ice and having that balance of being physical being present I just think helped bring me into more of just a defenseman as a whole and yeah I love the physicality who doesn't <laughs> I know I loved watching some of those hits that you you laid on some people yeah sometimes I overdid it I can agree and to my teammates sorry at camps uh, after the whistle but I was just trying to set the, set the tone and Dugs. that's all I could do <laughs> it dogs we yeah. were talking about that one earlier specifically at 20 2018 Olympic tryouts I think that's one thing that we'll never forget is yeah. seeing two of like our leaders and teammates like battle so hard that they literally got into a fight yeah it was at a Olympic fine line. tryouts yeah. yeah it was a fine line for me there I just remember the whole situation going down and she was you know being Meg's the tough guy <laughs> and she had the concussion issue so I remember I couldn't hit her up top like if she was like hitting me up top and I was like okay just keep it like underneath the neck and it, it was a for sure scrum, and I think it did open a lot of eyes. But during that time, that 2018, how important was that for us? And setting that tone, picking that team from there, I mean, I just think that it was just an important piece that needed to happen. Definitely. And so g going back and kind of leading up to your journey into an Olympian, like growing up, did you know that, you know, this was something like, when did you know that you wanted to be an Olympian and that you could be? Like, were you always better than everybody else or...? Did you kind of have to grow into that? I definitely grew into it. Um, playing boys, you know, I was just more so getting to understand the defensive structure of everything. I was a forward, and then I was always the last player back because I never wanted anyone behind me, so my coach put me at <laughs> You were sitting on the freaking goal line. <laughs> yeah, and you're always, always <laughs> like, responsible. <laughs> responsible, right? I never wanted to be that last person, and then someone goes by you, so I have moved to D. And it was during, I remember, I was at Berkshire, it was that 2002 Olympics. We watched with our team at my coach's house, and I was like, wow, like this is incredible. It's on TV. I'm watching Cameron Ganado. And I said, I want to be an Olympian. So it was that sophomore year um, at Berkshire where that spark happened. That's awesome. Yeah. And so 
went to high school at Berkshire for how many years? All four. All four, yeah. boarding Prep school. school. Yeah. Yeah. Did you like that experience? Or? Best experience. I would say it just shaped me for the rest of my life. Um, if I had to give anyone advice, and I know that girls hockey has changed a lot and it's more popular, but if anyone asked me, I'd say do the prep school, boarding school route, just because you know, you're not, you're developing, you're playing other sports, you're meeting other people, and you're learning about time management, discipline, commitment, all those things that maybe if I played juniors and just went through public high school, I wouldn't have learned. Maybe I would have been more of a partier. Uh, who knows? But <laughs> I'm a public school kid. <laughs> I'm a product of a public school. Yeah, but you're also a product yeah. of someone she who came out of it case. on the other yeah. side. <laughs> um, but case. yeah, I needed that in my life. Yeah. Um, I was such a homebody growing up. I still am a homebody. Um, but... I felt like just the community and the family environment at Berkshire was the perfect setting for me. And like I said, it prepared me for the rest of my life. Yeah, it probably helped you prepare for college as well. Yeah. Um, we know you went to UNH. What kind of went into that decision? Were there any other schools you were looking at? Um, I'm sure it definitely wasn't that swimming pool size of a rink. <laughs> I know. You said you hated conditioning, but I think you may have went there for the extra conditioning because yeah, that huge. rink is huge. They took in like five feet, though. Yeah, I was now. there yesterday. I did the color yeah. commentary for the Providence. Are you mad UNH. they didn't do that when you were there? <laughs> Honestly, it helped me. I think for the better. Yeah. Um, UNH was a great experience. I chose UNH um, basically because Rob was at Maine, but uh, I had St. Lawrence on the radar, which totally different location, totally different campus, but I love the coaching staff. And then Providence College was on my radar, but. It's because my fam, my extended family lived there, and I thought everyone would be able to come and support and be part of it, but it was, like, too much in the ghetto for me. I remember <laughs> my official visit. There were, like, ambulances, sirens, and I said, I will not be able to sleep four years, so I'm not yeah, coming Yeah, you're coming here. from Berkshire, so you're... <laughs> exactly. Um, and then St. Lawrence, they were wonderful, but I knew my parents wouldn't be able to come watch me play. And UNH was beautiful, New England campus, and I, I loved... Um, the coaching staff over time. I remember my first unofficial visit, the coach didn't come out and say hi to me or introduce himself. So I really didn't like that school at that time. And then I guess a couple like camps USA, he, he saw me and said like, who is this player? And my Berkshire coach said, well, she was at your school. And if you want her to come to your campus, you're gonna have to go through her mom. <laughs> like oh, serious, boy. like because my mom was even pissed because she was with me. But I ended up cho choosing UNH. My brother was at Maine. so. The commute to Maine and UNH was right there and easier for my parents just to balance both seeing us and we're such family oriented people so it it was right in my heart we'll have to get more on to hear about that conversation <laughs> I would oh, hate yeah. to be in her doghouse oh she'll tell the story yeah. the whole story and now her and my head coach from UNH are best friends because they talk about like antiques and decorating and everything it's hilarious and how good you were and oh, my mom will yeah I go never talk she about knows hockey. all your stats <laughs> Always. Every play. She was right? on USCHO all the, every weekend. <laughs> She's updating the Wikipedia. Yep, she probably had her own screen name talking in the thread. Oh, yeah. For the people sure. People that get on there are actually <laughs> it's insane. It's crazy, yeah. right? It is. It's ridiculous. We'll that, have to check yeah. up on that this year. Yeah, I don't think it's as popular though now, but back like 15 years ago, USCHO was like the social media of hockey, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, crazy. And now we have podcasts. Right. <laughs> so obviously a successful career in college and then on to the national team. At what age did you first make the national team? Do you remember that feeling? And Yeah, um, it was a tough journey in the beginning of the national team. I remember I was a freshman at UNH and I got invited to try out for the under-22 team. And that was the first time I ever got invited to put the jersey on and I was ultimately cut from the team. So first time ever excited, nervous, pressure, and I was caught. And <clears throat> right decision, wrong decision, you know, everyone can have their opinions, but I wasn't ready yet. And I think I needed that adversity to just grow as a player, grow as a person. It was either I could take that advice or take that cut and say, you know, oh, it's their fault. Like the coach made a decision that, you know, was wrong and I could, you know, blame everyone else or I could take it and say, this is my motivation for the next however long. And that's what I think I did because I, I knew no other way other than prove myself to people. So that's, that's what I did over time. And ironically, I got cut going into my sophomore year. I got an invite about three months later to go and play for the Four Nations. So I went from like getting cut to go play for the senior team right away. That's wow. awesome. Yeah. I remember like 
So like for me, my first worlds, you were like the defenseman that like I looked up to. I know a lot of the younger players looked up to and just like led their way in every aspect, showed us um, all the hard work that you put in and you were just a stable back there and, and somebody that we all looked up to. For you, do you remember like having those players like your first year? Who were those players for you? Oh yeah, like Angela Ruggiero. Like a little bit scary, oh. but like <laughs> yeah, you step on you just step on the bus with like all these legends and the Team USA, right? And it's like, how do you be like you just sit there and you're just so quiet, right? That was me. And then slowly, younger girl, I was, you know, I had it lucky because the the twins came on board right when I did, and so did like Erica Lawler, Gigi Marvin, Hillary Knight. So. That was kind of the start of like that core coming up. So you stay I, as a pack. Yeah. So I was lucky in that aspect of like, okay, there's like five rookies, so I'm like not the only one. But even like how we dressed and stuff, we were out of our element. And I'll never forget the first four nations. I think I got walked around by um, some of those Canadians. Just three breakaways I gave up, and I think they scored on like two of them. And I just would say I'm I'm not ready. But it was a great experience. But I, I remember that distinct uh, tournament in Kitchener, Ontario. And I got a few shifts, obviously, but I was way out of my element. Um, sold out crowd uh, in Canada, my first time ever putting the jersey on. I needed that, though. I think that that was the best thing that ever could have happened for me because after that, it was like, you know, you're playing in Sweden, Finland, and it's not as m many, like, fans there. It's still intense because you're playing at a world championship or four nations, but that sold out feeling like it's the best right and like it just brings nerves it brings pressure and it brings excitement and it's just an amazing game day feeling yeah and then from there like kind of thinking that you weren't ready how did you go back to the drawing board and what did you do differently because as being being your teammate like you were one yeah of like we've only known <laughs> you as like literally our best defender best one of the best players in women's ice hockey like oh, you guys are that's how nice. we know you so how did you get there and just like your your fitness level like is off the charts so i know you're doing stuff behind the scenes like what was the secrets that you were doing that you weren't telling anyone <laughs> give us the yeah. secrets yeah. So like now that you're done the like because we're still playing like how did you <laughs> have that six pack for 12 years yeah. i don't she still has i it. swear it's genetic i mean my brother hasn't worked out in 10 years he still has a six pack so i swear we are the same genetically um He's but over here <laughs> <laughs> i don't know i just think you know i think i learned I wasn't like I was at the very beginning, I'll tell you that. Like, I, I needed to learn about discipline and um, commitment and just, you know, giving everything every single day. And I had a few tough talks. And one of the, the tough talks I had was definitely uh, with Mike Boyle. And I remember this. Um, I was, after the 2010 Olympics, um, you know, I worked my butt off, but to the degree of, like, I thought I was working my butt off, right? It's It's all about perspective. So I remember... After that Olympics, I stayed at UNH and was a volunteer assistant coach, and I thought that would be good for experience, but I wasn't doing what I could with, for Team USA. I was still new to it. I didn't know how to balance, you know, after college and playing pro, and I was slacking, and that's the best way I can explain it. I remember going to 2012, uh, 2011 Switzerland pre-World Championships. We had conditioning, right? <laughs> We had oh, to do yeah. that test, goal line to blue line, seven, <laughs> seven times. times, rest seven times again, and that in-between score is the marker of, like, are you conditioned, are you not? You want to get, like, two seconds difference. I had, like, a seven-second difference, and Same. that was bad. And so Mike took me aside and said, I just want to let you know if I was to pick this team, you wouldn't be on it. And that hit home for me. And I made the team. Luckily, we won. It was an amazing tournament, amazing experience. But in the back of my head throughout that whole tournament, I said, I need to make changes in my life. So I moved to Boston right after that World Championships. And that's when my change in development and hard ass started right, right from that summer on. And I needed that kick in the butt. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me because then I could kind of focus on just hockey and being a leader and being the best player and person that I, that I could be. That <laughs> I could be player and person. Way to ruin Sorry. the moment. <laughs> I, I had the chills listening to you there though, like hearing that change, because I was kind of coming onto the team, like started like making camps 2010 and like you were already established then, like I knew that you were a really good defender and just continued to, to grow from there on out. Um, and then, 
You were also talking. I forgot. About, <laughs> yeah, you'll, you'll get it. Forgot. You'll get it. I have a question though, actually, because you were also talking about like adjusting, like after college and figuring out how to train on your own, like professional leagues and whatnot. But we hadn't reached an agreement with USA Hockey for more support until 2017. Yeah. And when did you graduate? 09, oh, I was uh, looking. 2009. Yeah. Oh, it was so, a treat. How, like, how, like, I can't even imagine. How were you able to continue to train at the highest level and be one of the best defensemen in the world and compete while basically living off, like, what, two grand a month we got yeah. to train? Yeah, and not taxed, and that came up to for eight kick, years. Kiss, for eight or, years, yeah, and it was tough because it wasn't taxed, so I never knew anything about money. We never were taught how to take care of our money. That was one of the biggest things I look back and say, I wish USA Hockey would just like teach us like how how to handle this money and what to do. But I was living in Boston, the rent was crazy, so I had to live with five other people in order to just like balance that money out and then you're spending all your money on basically training and Cairo and massage because none of that was covered so there were times where we weren't getting paid exactly the first of the month sometimes our checks would come at on the 7th or the 16th and I'm like mom I gotta pay rent yeah. can you um you know Venmo me or like e -tran like whatever that they we had back then or just give me cash to give my landlord <laughs> and then I'll give you money the money when my check comes in so basically every month it was catch up my mom gave me money quickly for rent. My check would come in. $600 would go right to my mom. So then I'm like pinching pennies for the next th three weeks. And so it was just a battle financially. Mm -hmm. And over time, I knew that I had to, you know, take on another job and make more money. So I coached at Merrimack College um, 14, 15, um, 15, 16 year. And it was tough to balance work mm -hmm. and training. And I, you're gone for months at a time. Right. Like it's hard to do any normal job. You almost need somebody, an employer who's like willing to work with you. Totally. In your schedule. And that's that was the priority. So Merrimack was my priority. So if I had a Boston Pride game or like a, a game that weekend and Merrimack was playing, I would have to miss that game. And that was just how it is. So it was really tough for your development aspect and your training aspect. And at the same time, in the mornings, I wasn't training at the gym with my teammates. I was going in at five o'clock in the morning and just training on my own. So it was an adjustment, but I think that it really helped me hone in on like that discipline and what really matters. Um, so it was something I needed to do, but financially, I'm glad we went into the direction that we did and fought for what we needed. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Cause I personally like graduated after that. I remember sitting in my college dorm room, like pre-world championships in 2017, when we were starting to go through our negotiations and we were talking about boycotting our worlds on home soil. This was the only leverage we had. Yeah. And I just remember being a younger kid thinking like, oh my gosh, like, are we just not going to go? Like what's happening? Like, is it that big of a deal? And just hearing you guys lead the way and hear about your experiences, it was monumental yeah. to be able to achieve that. So I guess from your side, being an older player, like in 2017, like that boycott and just heading late to the Worlds and then winning, like what was that whole experience like for you? Yeah, crazy because it really started like what, three, two years before that, when we were having all those meetings, we were talking about it, we were preparing for it, it was in people's ears, but like, your first Worlds was what, 2015? Mm -hmm. Right, so like you kind of have solidified yourself already. You've understood the process. And then once this really came on heavy, you were probably like, awesome, like I'm gonna follow suit. But like players that that was their first world championship, that's hard to swallow. Like Callie Flanagan, I remember like, I feel so bad because she was going mm -hmm. to camps, going to camps, and then she finally made this world. But we're going to boycott and maybe not play, and that might be her only opportunity. So you really felt for players like that, but you kind of had to look at the greater good because they tried to do it back in 98, and they couldn't do it. And it was all because of unity, and people weren't together. And our situation, the leaders that we had at that time, we had like a core of like eight to ten people. That It was just that is the reason why I feel like we were able to deliver the message to the younger girls and have them understand, okay, if this is gonna happen, it's gonna happen now. And it was for the best, right? I think mm -hmm. that looking back, that was probably one of the most 
talented, skills, skilled teams that we ever had stepping on that ice for that 2017 World Championships. How good were we? I mean, like, we missed the whole pre-camp. We were talking yeah. about this. Like, we didn't go to camp. We're just waiting, sitting around, and then we show up, and we're like, all right, let's play. Well, that was probably half Worlds. the part. I mean, we go to those, those camps, and we get absolutely destroyed. Yeah. <laughs> Physically, <laughs> mentally, let's throw in tests. everything. Whereas, if you're doing those things along the way, you go to these camps, and you're just like, okay, let's, you know – get prepared to go to these world champions not championships not kill the kids and the girls at this time so i felt like mentally it helped us out so much because we just get, went to michigan and yeah. stepped on the ice and played it's almost like that feeling like we have we have to win now it, like absolutely you can't show up late to a worlds and not perform yeah, totally and we had the support right all mm -hmm. the little girls with the signs like the sold out arena like we felt it yeah and i think that just having that support and unity around not just the fans but all the women that got asked to play for us and they said no. And that, that is a statement and that is something that is gonna go down in my heart as like just the most historic thing that we've ever done. Yeah, I don't even think people realize yet how big that was. And I don't know, I honestly don't know when that would have happened again if it didn't happen in 2017. Like you said, we boycotted as a team, but I don't think people realize that we had to have boycott like the entire nation had to boycott. Totally. Otherwise, they were going to take any team to world championships. Right. They asked anyone. D3, <laughs> like D, like anyone. And I'm like, oh, my God. How, what, where's the respect? You like play for hockey? Us, like not Suit even up. caring if we, we put a team in there and they lost and they were last place. They didn't care. And that was the thing that hurt the most. We were like, man, we are on an island. And if we can get out of this on top, it's going to be a, a, a statement. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, I, and I think we've come so far now which is awesome to see. There's still a ways to go. Yeah. But I think that was a huge step in the right direction um, to be able to do that. And like Kess was saying, like we don't get that done without the right leaders in the room, you guys that are on the phone yeah. day in and day out, calling every hockey player that lives in the U.S. saying, yeah. telling our story and saying, will you please like stand with us and yeah, that was probably the biggest thing is we divided all D1, D3 coaches, NCAA, use, like any, anyone. And we had to just say, listen, this is what our vision is and this is our goal. Yeah. And please, if, if this is going to work and, you know, we're going to be successful with this, you have to just say no. And it's going to be beneficial for not our generation. Yeah, we might get a little extra money, but it's for those girls like coming on the national team now, five years from now, that's, that's where the difference is going to be. And you're going to see. Yeah. You're a kid. So you're not making $20,000 a year eating ramen noodles. <laughs> They're not calling up you asking uh, to pay their rent. Yeah. <laughs> Just the saddest thing ever. And you know what? I'm not great with money and I've gotten way better um, over my retirement time. But listen, I was a professional athlete at the time and I wasn't making a lot of money. So when we started making more money, I was like, I want to shop. I want to go. I bought an. I got an Audi A4, my dream car, and probably not helping me financially. Window. All of the paycheck is just into yep. the Audi. I was like, why not? I'm doing it, and you know, I, I had some financial trouble along the way, but I've I've learned a lot. Um, but man, I don't know if I would have been able to survive and continue to play if we were still making two thousand dollars a month. It's no. crazy. And then that World Championships, we we went on to win, and you had a a big part in that. Like, yeah, you did. Holy crap. You remember that? <laughs> Do I remember that? I go, who is, like, what's going on here? I actually, like, as You're intense. scoring goals below the dots. As like, intense as the game was, like, I kind of, like, at that second goal, I laughed. Like, the first goal, yup, slap shot from the point, exciting, bam. But then the second goal, when I'm, like, joining the rush, sitting in front of the net, getting a pass in between <laughs> Niter's legs, scoring, and then just, like, another celebration. I'm like, I have two goals. I've never scored two goals in my entire <laughs> in the life. Championship game at World Championships. But I didn't like, think about that. Like our team played unbelievable. And then honestly, I look back and like Niter's goal was at the absolute picture perfect goal. And the Selly with the overtime and the fans. It was just a cherry on top for that whole situation and that whole fight. It was. It was. That's like literally one of my most memorable tournaments. Yeah, I think. I think so too. And like being on home ice, we don't do it much. But when we did, it was just. It was amazing to see that sold out crowd um, mm -hmm. during that time. And it just, it, I think it helped boost us for that next year. Mm -hmm. it was, yeah, like you're saying, boosted us for the next year going into 2018, our Olympic year. Yeah. And you had been to two before and unfortunately, slash fortunately, silver at both of them. Like, totally. How do you come back from that? And like, you know, how do you continue pushing 
after losing your first two Olympics? Yeah, that, probably the hardest thing. <clears throat> you know, how, what would my career have been if we won in 2010 and we got gold? You know, would I have continued to play? Um, I think losing in 2010, we weren't as good as Canada yet, but at 2014, I really think we could have won that game, and it came down to the last three minutes. Um, most heartbreaking loss of my entire career. I'll never forget it, but it grew us as players. It grew us as a program, our culture, and it might have been the best thing that ever happened for us because I believe when we stepped on to the soil in Pyeongchang, we had no doubts in our mind that we were going to come back with gold. There was nothing um, in our way. We never compared ourselves to Canada. It was just us and our success, and we just kind of sat and rolled with it. And it was just an amazing tournament mentally, physically. It was just we did everything right, and we deserve to win that game. I truly believe it. Yeah, I think it's one of those teams where it's like you always have to kind of exude confidence and think that you're better than your opponent. But it was one of those years, I think, that we knew, like, no matter what, that we were going to win, we were going to find a way, and we truly, truly believed that. Yeah, I, I think during that 10-14 to 14 run, we in, implemented, like, mental skills, like, yes, to a degree. But I think <laughs> <Sorry>. to a degree. <laughs> <laughs> to a and large degree. To a large degree, right? <laughs> and then 2014, I think we understood that, like, wow, like, we need to do more because we weren't, that was where we lacked that last three minutes. It was all mental, right? And that's, that's the bottom line. And I think now when we went back to the drawing board from 2014 to 18, I think a lot of more girls, like, bought into, like, we don't want to lose. Mm -hmm. And I think we had, you know, we, like we always talked about, the great mixture of rookies and veterans that rookies have been winning, 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 and then veterans that have that fire to finally get a gold medal. Put all that together, and I think it, we just had the perfect recipe for success in Pyeongchang. Yeah, it's funny you say that, because I feel like we're kind of in a similar place now yeah. as a program, where it's almost like a new wave of young kids that are coming up, and it's like that good chunk. Yeah. And we were those young kids at one point, and now to be on the other side, it's like interesting to see. Totally. And but. listen, you like you were that for me. But I knew that you were going <laughs> to yeah, find we had a your crew. way. Like I wouldn't like I didn't ever want to be that like leader that was I didn't want to like yell at people or like rookies that it's their first, second time. Like they got to find their way. Right. And they will over, over time. <laughs> um, like it's an amazing feeling, though, when you see like you, I've seen you grow and it just clicks and the player that you have become from when you started. You were unbelievable when you started. But even like when we were training. Oh, but I was serving up meatballs <laughs> through the middle. Bud Light, say. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, some of those too. By the end of my career, when we were skating with Brian, defense, like I was watching you and trying to learn from you on those those um, tight tight turns, tight pivots, the and like work. the angling, the edge work. I'd be like, Meg, how do you do it? How do you get out of it so quick? And like, I was learning from you by the I end. I think I was, was like, incredible. I don't know. Yeah. I just keep doing it. I just like, like good hips. Couple times. <laughs> and you two Definitely are my not. favorite two defensemen to go against because you were the hardest to go against. Like Casey's stick was like unbelievable. You'd be, you'd be nowhere near me. And then all of a sudden the puck's off my stick like that. Those forearms that poke check. Listen, I think I added height every like little bit I could, oh, right? It was unbelievable. Yeah. Every year you're playing, you're just adding another inch. So you don't need to skate as far there. Those poke checks, though, I it did a, it did damage on me. I had uh, tennis elbow surgery in uh, April. Stop. Yeah, this year. So I, I, no like, way. I couldn't even extend my arm anymore, and it was this one, my poke checking, but. It is so did we lose the poke check? It's unbelievable. You still no, have it? I'm I have no scared. Pain now. I've been getting that, that now. Yeah, but it's just it was definitely one thousand percent because of all the poke checks. I'll tell you that. I thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> kidding. We'll take you. We'll take you back. Yeah, yeah. I, I do miss it. I do miss the locker room. I miss the competition, like that game day, being in Denmark, scouting, like just you know, being in warm ups, getting getting just pumped, like it's just an amazing feeling, right? I, that's why I continued to play for so long. Just that game day excitement, pressure, preparation, all in one. I loved it. We well, speak. while we're on the topic yeah, we, of retirement, we skipped that a little bit, but um, yeah. So 2018, win gold, and you continue training, and you know you're still at the top of your game, still, if not the best, one of the best D in the world, and you decide to retire within a year of the Olympics. Like, yeah, you would have made the team. I'll say it like you would have been on that team. So you would have, you would have been logging the most <laughs> minutes for sure. Well, probably with, <laughs> with the, the minutes I saw back there with the D. 
<laughs> oh yeah that was but anyways what led to that decision and you know was it hard you know I look at my whole career in like phases right so I look at like the Olympic years and like those phases and then after 2018 that was a tough year we all know mm -hmm. it and I think after winning gold it was like I like I could finally relax that's how I felt like the euphoria went through my body and it was kind of like I knew I wasn't done, but I was like, I could be done. And that was the feeling that went through my body kind of after, during that summer. And I was like, I don't really know what I want to do. Um, a lot of stuff happened, you know, in my personal life that I knew that I needed to change. And, you know, it made me a stronger person. And one of my good friends, Carson Duggan, said she was moving back to Edmonton slash Calgary area. And Brianna Decker and I said, why don't we go and play in Calgary and go and play in the CWHL and just ch change our lifestyle kind of change our training and just see how we feel. Um, and it was probably the best decision I made. Um, I loved it. I met my future wife there. Um, hockey was fun again. I was playing with like different players, different Canadians, getting a different perspective of their training. The inside scoop. Yeah, everything. <laughs> but I loved it and I gained so much respect for them because I saw like different players that I knew, but then I saw their habits mm -hmm. on the ice, off the ice. And I, I tr wanted to be here and show them like these are our habits on our team. So it was it was great because it pushed me in that aspect. But um, you know, I got a few extra years left. I thought that that CWHL year was wonderful with the Calgary Inferno. We went on to win and great experience. COVID happened. As COVID, you know, happened, we were the trying to kill. Do, do everything training wise, um, but it kind of got hard. You were training on a pond. Training, yeah. yeah. Like I remember watching videos. Like you're like, you built your own gym too. Like. Yeah. You had to do what you had to do, right? To, mm -hmm. to get by. We all know that that's a sacrifice you make, but after like 26 a.m. wake ups, skating with five people and just doing skills, it gets a little tiresome. Mm -hmm. It gets a little boring. Um, but then kind of ramped up a bit. We were having, before that, we were having a lot of camps canceled. So, you know, you'd get prepared, you'd get to the peak, and then, oh, we'd get the call canceled. So then it's like, yeah. well, what are you going, what are we, what are we training for now? Um, but I, I tried to stay with it and, you know, went back to, I think it was a camp in March or something in Minnesota. It was one of the, it was the camp right before world championship camps. Oh no, we were in Maine. Maine. Nope. Right before that. It was in Minnesota. Oh really? Remember we took our, I took my picture like of getting engaged and stuff, whatever. Yeah. But hmm. I remember coach Corkum came out to me and was like, you know, what's wrong? Like, you're just not looking like yourself out there. I go, no, coach, I'm not, because I'm not skating with anyone. I'm skating by myself, <laughs> like, trying to do the best I can in Calgary, blah, blah, blah. And that's another moment I looked in the mirror and said, I have to make a change, because someone's questioning me. So I went to Boston, right? And so yeah. right before that uh, World Championships in Halifax, I went and trained at Mike's uh, for, like, two, three weeks with you, and it was incredible. It brought we me almost, back. We almost got you back. Yeah, it brought me back to that 2011 time, right, when I was do, making a change, and it was, inc it was I loved it. It was fun to have somebody totally. to train with. And I think with. that like, we I got closer. I love that you were, were coming in. Yeah, and we pushed each other, and I love training with you. It was incredible. Um, and, you know, we had camp, and it was, I thought I, I played better in that camp. It was solid. I had a little scrum in front of the net, which, you know, probably thought <laughs> ended my career. Rightfully so. Yeah. Rightfully so. Um, but, you know, I remember this to the day. We were ready to go. We had a little scrimmage before we leaving for Halifax, and coach was everywhere, going in the stands, coming back, and I was like, what's going on? And I remember we were playing bad, our team, so I t called the timeout. We were like <laughs> We losing. were terrible. <laughs> terrible. I go, guys. I must have been on the other team. We I were, think my team was pretty good. Camp. Yeah, so <laughs> I was even playing bad at that time, and I was just like, I, something needs to be said here. So I just like kind of brought people in and kind of did the Casey, like, get your shit together. And then we played a little bit better after that, so I finally, we ended the game, and I felt better, but then Katie Millian, our GM, came on the ice and said, sad to say, the world championships are canceled. And right in that moment, I knew in my heart that I was retiring. Mm -hmm. So I knew after we yeah. were all hanging out, I knew... I was retiring. I told Dex the next day, wow. and it was my birthday. It's crazy. Yeah, I just huh. you, you know I follow Everything my heart for a reason. Yeah, yeah. It's just crazy to think like if the worlds had happened. Totally. You know. Yeah. But and during this time, like I was trying, try kind of talking to the um, you know coworkers that I work for now, and like that kind of vision and moving on to the next chapter of my life seemed exciting and every time I kind of went back to USA Hockey like my heart wasn't completely in it I was trying mm -hmm. to do it for like getting better and developing like for the team but like 
I just, when my heart isn't in something, I, it's not fair to the team, it's not fair to me. And I truly believed that someone who was trying out and maybe got cut a few times, like Jensi Dunn, she would have that chance to make a team. And she did, and that's wonderful. But I, I never wanted to, you know, be on a team that I wasn't giving my all, not giving 100% in every aspect. Well, that's why you're one of the, the best leaders and teammates that I've ever had and that women's hockey, I think, has ever seen. Yeah, no, I appreciate really that. to what you just said. Um, yeah. But the people want to know, <laughs> did your headband retire with you? Or do you still break that out every once in a while? Is it under your hat? Well, yeah, the headband is Rob just, it's a, born sta- it. it's a statement. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, I always say it's my signature, but I think Margarita's has turned into my signature <laughs> now. Um, but my, my wife doesn't love the headband. She likes like the wispies out and I'm like, it holds everything back. It's wonderful. You don't we'll have, have to worry to put about some the wind. pictures of the headband. For in, people that don't here. know yeah, Casey bore this black headband every single day and second of her <laughs> life. She even snuck it into headshots. Like I'm like, who gets like an accessory in their headshots? But like somehow I was going back on Google and it's in every single Always. photo. I know. Yeah. Usually they're like, take that off. Tuck in your necklace, this, that. Yeah, I just Casey's I headband. Know. Nope, comfort thing. <laughs> I have about twenty. I at think home. you had one. Like I remember, like one day when it broke. Like, that was the one. You were devastated. It was the like, thick one, and it was like hard plastic. Now yep. I have like these rubber ones that you can adjust, but that plastic one, it was a little thicker, so it made things look maybe a little cuter, a little more different. <laughs> and <laughs> you're dying. Oh yeah, Catholic school headband. We were. Yeah, I'd say like literally when I was in third grade at Catholic school, my jumper like that was like the headband provided that like we could wear. Yeah, you know what? Maybe I just always have that little kid inside of me, and yeah. the headband. And never thought anything about mm-hmm. it. I just loved it. Yep. Yep. That you be awesome. you. You know. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You were always you. Now we're always. on to Margs. Well, I know Margs and yeah. hats. I've been trying this hat thing out. I don't know how I feel about it, but I'm doing it. Hats look good on you. Yeah. It when off. it first came out, I think Dex did it so much. I gave her crap, like calling her like Indiana Jones, like Brianna Decker, like when she would wear it because that's what it looked like, like yeah. Indiana Jones. So we called her Brindiana Jones. And now I started wearing them. So I'm sorry, Dex, for that. It's the style. Yeah. So, yes. Anyways, one of the greatest defensemen in history. You're always welcome to come back out of retirement. The team would take you. But... Kind of to wrap it up here, we're asking all of our guests, like, what was your it factor? What made you so successful? It's a great question. Um, never wanting to let anyone down. I think that that was always in the back of my mind. Um, I, I think just starting from prep school and just how my, our parents raised us, I, I never wanted to be a disappointment, never wanted to let anyone down. And so that's why I always tried to work twice as hard. So that was never you know, a thought in anyone's mind. And I just always wanted to come to the rink, lead by example, be a great teammate. Um, I think in life, that's the most important. It's the relationships that you build and you're not gonna play hockey forever, but hopefully that you can keep the people in your life, hockey-wise, in your life forever, no matter what. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, yeah. Should we end with a little fun game? Yeah, let me get a little sip. Let's yeah. do it, yeah. Yeah, get some inspiration. having this Yeti over here. Yeah, that, that goes perfect for this Doesn't game. It? Yeah. yeah. This is, this is another segment that we're going to be doing with all our guests. It's called the Starting Five. Okay. And we're going to pick a different category each week. But since you're on, we thought we'd go with your Starting Five cocktails. Ooh. We already know number one. I love that. But we'll be drafting but, today. Okay. So, you can't. So, th- starting off cocktails? Like, like just yeah, my favorite five. starting five. Okay. Yep. Cocktails. So, I'll go with. Top five. We're not drafting today? Kess can, wants to draft, so we'll each pick. Like you can't one, take it once I take a repeat cocktail. Oh. You can't have it. Okay, well I'll start with a spicy margarita. No, no, you're Kess, not first. Kess wins. <laughs> no, yeah. fine, fine. We're the host. I'll go with it. I'll go I'm with drafting it. first. I have the margarita. Okay. So you can't choose Marg. Um, then I would probably go with um, a Grey Goose Martini. Damn. I'm gonna go with. An espresso martini. Shout out to Scrupa. Moscow Mule. Old fashioned. Uh, go back to my college days. Dirty Shirley. Oh, that's good. A nice red Barillo. Just skip me. Yeah. Bloody Barillo. Mary. Barillo. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. What do you got? Caesar. B- Barillo? Yeah, nice red. 
What, you're going Caesar now because you live in Canada? Lo- Guys, they're so much better. You have to give them a chance. Really? They're, what they're is it? incredible. Clamato juice? They're just, it's not as or, thick. Yeah, it's oh. Clamato juice. And I'm all about the toppings for the bloodies. If you trusted me to make you a good mark, I should be a bartender in my next life. All right. Yeah. I'm just going to go like, like vodka soda. Is that said? No, I was going to take that. Um, let's see. I'll go with a Cosmo. Okay. Number Sour four. beer. Sour beer? Yep. Is that a cocktail? It's a beer. Oh. We'll count it. Okay. Okay. She hits you. <laughs> she hits you. <laughs> that's not a cocktail. Um, all right. That's good, though. We'll that's not bad. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to hit them all. I'm going to do tequila soda with, like, pineapple juice. Ooh. It's like a knockoff mark. That is good. All right. Then I'll just go with the... Uh, a nice a um, shot. <laughs> yeah, maybe a shot. No, since Casey switched it up here, I'll go with a glass of red wine, a good cab. Now Perfect. we're going rogue. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, top five, you know, I'd say after that, Prosecco. I'm going to be the only one sticking with cocktails, <laughs> and I'll do a Jack and Coke. That's perfect. There we go. We have our. That's it. I'm our a sipper though. That's why. Like I'm. I'm a sipper, so I enjoy my drinks, but I. I don't get wild. Like you know. You some don't get people, wild anymore. No, not as much. Um, I just can't do it like I used to. Can't. Can't stay out as long. You guys will know. You get the two day hangover. Yeah, I get the tired. Need to go to bed. Oh, same. <laughs> one drink in. Yep. I'm down. All right. Well, I think I think we hit it all. Um, thanks for joining our podcast, Case. Uh, Thank you. First guest in the books um you can like and subscribe on torch's youtube channel you can listen on spotify and apple follow us on instagram, instagram. the keller and kess show love it you guys are going to do great things i can't wait to watch all of your episodes um just incredible we'll have you back we'll i would love that you're, yeah, you're going to be a two. recurring guest i think love yeah that. We got to dive deeper into that love life of yours. Absolutely. You know? yeah. <laughs> Love's love. Love is love. Passionate love. about everything we'll in life. just get her out of retirement, too. <laughs> yeah. Once she comes back, that's it. I have to get in the gym first. Yeah. <laughs> you look great. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Case. You look great. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode uh, with Casey Bellamy. You can like and subscribe on Apple, Spotify, Torch Pro's YouTube channel, and stay tuned for... The next upcoming episode, we have another awesome guest, uh, Haley Skrupa, a teammate of ours, another hilarious person. You're going to be laughing, I think, the whole episode. So follow along. Thanks, guys.